Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the uh, student uh, presentations. I actually feel like a game show host right now, walking amongst the people. But um, to give you a little uh, uh, groundwork, we're, we're, we have five presentations between 11 and 12.15. Uh, so each group or person will get a total of 15 minutes. So at 15 minutes, I'll stand up, and if it goes too much longer, I'll be throwing water balloons at people. <laughs> so um, the first presentation will be uh, by Jennifer Morris, and she'll be talking about COPD, and it's a matter of breath and death. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Morris, and I'm a registered nurse enrolled in the RN to BSN nursing program here at UMFK. Having graduated from the University of Maine and Augusta in 2007, I've been a nurse for six years now. On more than one occasion, I've seen patients struggle. Symptoms of disease, side effects of treatment, and pain are all factors that impact the quality of life for my patients. To struggle to breathe, to not even have enough air to hold a simple conversation or take a deep breath is truly one of the scariest experiences an, inv an individual can endure. Along with some handouts that were passed out, most of you have a straw. I know some of you didn't come in in time. Um, I'd like to do a very quick experiment. When you're ready, pinch your nose closed, take a deep breath, inhaling and exhaling slowly through the straw. Go ahead. <laughs> It's very difficult to take a nice deep breath, isn't it? This experiment is intended to demonstrate how extremely difficult it is to breathe with COPD. Lung disease has touched not only the lives of my patients, but those I love the most. Have you ever had one of those truly nasty colds? One that gave you a persistent, exhausting cough and a chest full of mucus that left you just winded enough that you had a difficult time crossing the room without becoming breathless? What if those symptoms never went away and got progressively worse? That is what it's like to have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The reason I'm here today is to introduce the topic of COPD. I'll provide a basic overview of the disease, its causes, symptoms, prevention, and how it impacts us as individuals as well as a population. What is COPD? These concepts and terms help us define what COPD actually is. C refers to the chronicity of the disease. COPD is not an illness, illness that is developed overnight. It's the result of years of damage. O refers to the fact that people with COPD have difficulty getting air into and out of their lungs due to some form of obstruction or blockage. P tells us where the disease takes place. Though COPD occurs in the lungs, it affects all other body systems and contributes to the development of other illnesses. Lastly, D is for disease. This term tells us the condition to be, should be taken seriously because it affects our health. My take home message today is going to be COPD is not curable, but it is preventable. It is a serious lung disease that progresses slowly and over time makes it very difficult to breathe. COPD is actually an umbrella term that includes two diseases. It includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Both of those are forms of COPD. Emphysema does two things. It causes the air sacs in the lungs to be gradually destroyed, and it causes us to lose our elasticity in our lungs. And as a result, our lungs aren't able to expand or deflate properly, so we can't breathe as well, and we become chronically short of breath. In chronic bronchitis, scarring and swelling caused by illness result in narrowed airways, making it hard to breathe. Not only can you see it in the graphic up there, but this is what we felt in our straw experiment that we just did. Both conditions result in permanent damage to the lungs that makes breathing more difficult. COPD can develop for years without noticeable symptoms. Once they get, begin to appear, symptoms are subtle. Mild symptoms generally don't prompt people to seek the medical attention that they need. 
Because there is no sudden onset, many individuals simply brush the symptoms aside, blaming breathlessness and fatigue on aging, attributing their cough and wheeze to current smack, smoking habits or illnesses such as a common cold. It's important to keep in mind that COPD develops slowly. Symptoms appear only after 50 to 70% of your lung functions already been lost. It's gone. And remember, you can't get that back. Individuals with a disease lose their lung function two to three times faster than someone who does not have a COPD diagnosis. Symptoms worsen as the disease progresses, and the severity of symptoms depends on how much lung damage has actually occurred. In addition to smoking, there are several risk factors related to the development of COPD. These factors include long-term exposure to environmental triggers, such as indoor and outdoor air pollutants, occupational dust, chemicals and allergens. Genetics and family history can also play a role in development of the disease. As far as family history goes, not everyone who has COPD is a current or former smoker. Though it's rare there's a genetic deficiency linked to the development of COPD, it's called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and it's caused by a missing protein in the DNA. While all factors play a role in the development of COPD, smoking cigarettes is the primary risk factor and the single most preventable cause of the disease. So this will be our focus regarding preventative efforts during the presentation. Today's smoking trend determines tomorrow's COPD burden. As long as individuals continue to smoke, the incidence of COPD will continue to rise and people will continue to die. The relationship between cigarette smoking and the development of the disease cannot be overstated. In looking over the slide, keep in mind the term smoking applies to current as well as former cigarette smoking behaviors. The more a person smokes, the more likely it is that person will develop COPD. Smokers are 10 times more likely to be diagnosed than non-smokers. As far as Maine goes, while the U.S. smoking rates have shown a gradual decline over the past several years, Maine's have not. We've held steady. 22.8% of Maine adults smoke, which is higher than the national average of 21.1%. COPD is preventable and treatable, but there is no cure for the disease. It becomes physically, emotionally, and financially devastating. Because it gets worse over time, the disease can have a significant impact on the quality of life. Individuals struggle with symptoms on an everyday basis. Limited by their debilitating symptoms, they avoid activities that they used to enjoy. The ability to work and the ability to socialize are often lost. Symptoms of shortness of breath make it difficult to sleep and eat. Many individuals struggle with basic hygiene and getting dressed out every day. Each breath truly becomes a struggle. Every ounce of energy someone has becomes focused on getting enough oxygen. Everything else falls by the wayside. The psychological impacts can be just as devastating as the physical symptoms. Adults with COPD are 10 times more likely to be diagnosed with depression and anxiety. <coughs> Financially, the disease is a burden on individuals and families. There is lost productivity related to disability and early death. Monthly health care charges are generally more than three and a half times higher for a patient with COPD than those without the diagnosis. In looking at the information on the slide, the statistics serve to illustrate the burden COPD has on public health. This information highlights the social and economic impacts of the disease. The disease is a public health burden and a leading cause of death, as you can see. It has been officially deemed a public health threat. Among the leading causes of death nationally, COPD is the only disease with an increasing death toll because of disability, lost productivity, and early death, rates associated with the, with the disease take a heavy toll on our economy and contribute substantially to our na national health care burden. Nationally, the cost for the disease in 2010 was $49.9 billion. Estimates suggest that in less than 20 years, the disease will be one of the five leading global medical burdens on society. 
These figures are staggering. Because of its slow progression, COPD is most often diagnosed in people over 40 with a positive smoking history. With increased awareness and, pro and appropriate screening, it can be diagnosed much earlier than that. It's crucial to catch COPD early to prevent damage to the lungs. Once damage occurs, it cannot be reversed, but it can be slowed and managed. Because most patients seek medical attention late in the course of their disease, they often have limited treatment options. As far as diagnosis, diagnosis is made through a simple breathing test called spirometry. It measures the airflow and it's very accurate. It can detect symptoms before they become severe, resulting in not only earlier diagnosis and treatment, but better prognosis. When found early, there are, treatment, uh, there are many treatments that help manage COPD and improve quality of life. Treatment generally involves a combination of the therapies that you see on the slide. For many individuals, COPD can be managed effectively with education, lifestyle changes, and medications that are used to keep the airways open. Understanding the positive impacts of smoking cessation is key in reducing COPD prevalence. Smoking cigarettes has no benefit. There is no safe level of tobacco use at any time or at any age. Quitting is beneficial at any age. It's never too late to quit smoking and potentially ward off the effects of the disease. Even for those already diagnosed, quitting can lessen symptoms and slow progression. And I don't think enough people know that. 36% of patients with COPD in Maine can continue to smoke despite having the diagnosis. So, you know. I don't think people recognize the benefits of quitting even if you do have the disease. Regarding smoking cessation, there are many ways to quit. What works for one person may not work for another. The best advice I can give is to speak with your health care provider to determine which treatments might be appropriate for you. It is worth noting that studies show the combination of meds and counseling is the most effective in cessation more so than either meds or counseling used alone. In addition to the treatment modalities, there are specific resources in Maine that have been proven very helpful for those trying to quit. Those include the Maine Tobacco Helpline. Trained professionals provide over the phone clinical treatment for individuals who want to quit. Success rates for those using the helpline are three times higher than, res than results seen with smokers who quit on their own. The helpline actually has a successful 21% long-term quit rate, which is really good. The Partnership for Tobacco-Free Maine and the American Lung Association are all great resources for both smoking, sense, smoking cessation and the management of COPD. As a side, if anyone wants, I have some freebies from the Partnership for Tobacco-Free Maine, magnets, pencils, all kinds of stuff. Um, after the symposium, I have a big bag of stuff there. What can we do? Know the risk factors and ask questions is key to reducing prevalence and increasing awareness about the disease. Do the very best you can to take care of yourself, implement a healthy lifestyle. Reducing exposure to risk factors, again, is the most important step in preventing the onset and progression of the disease. In summary, if you've never smoked, don't start. If you're a past smoker, kudos to you for quitting. Please see your health care provider for appropriate screening and early intervention. And for those who do smoke, it's never too late to quit and potentially ward off COPD. And I have a list of resources here. Um, I can give them to anybody who wants after the presentation if you want to know more. But that's it. We have about a minute and a half for questions if uh, anybody would like to ask Jennifer a question. There's a lot of ongoing research um, in regards to that now. I actually tried to get some information to bring with me, but I didn't get it in time. Um, from what I've seen, the literature suggests that they aren't, there's actual carcinogens in them that while they're not tobacco, they're just as harmful as tobacco can be. So I wouldn't say, yes, it's a great treatment, go out and get it. I don't know. I, I can get the information for you, I'm sure. Um, 
but I want to say it was the CDC. There was a few resources that said the carcinogens that are in the actual electronic cigarettes are just as bad as the nicotine that you would get from smoking a cigarette. Anything you put in the lungs that's an irritant is going to cause damage. Sure. Tony? There is. I didn't get into it because there's so, <laughs> I can be long-winded, let's just say that. Um, there is a lot of information. Secondhand smoke is just as harmful as someone who's actually smoking the cigarette. So there's, there's actually, um, there's some new legislation I think that's going through on secondhand smoke and I can also get that for anybody who wants it. I worked with the Partnership for Tobacco Free Maine this summer and got a bunch of information from them regarding that. Yep, yep, they are. Um, COPD is very prevalent, not only among the elderly, but in rural areas because there's a higher incidence of smoking and tobacco use in those rural areas. So there is. Um, the American Lung Association just did, I think it was in 2011, a study on that, and there's a report on their website that illustrates those points specifically. So in, um, in urban areas, do you think they could be more... I mean, excuse me, rural areas. Did I say urban? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, rural areas. There's, there is a report online, uh, the American Lung Association, literally, specifically on rural um, smoking and effects of COPD. Yep. Uh, thank you kindly, Jennifer, You're for welcome. a most informative talk. Thank you. Okay, our next presentation um, will be presented by uh, Emily Wister, uh, Lori Bishop, and Holly Stanwood, and uh, they'll be talking about what's eating you. Good morning. I'm Emily Wister. This is Lori Bishop and Holly Stanwood. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to present to you guys today at the Scholar Symposium. Uh, this the presentation was created as part of a group aggregate project for our Promoting Healthy Communities with Dr. Jenny Radzma. And while it is focused on nursing students, stress affects everyone in every program, so it really is applicable to, to anyone who's, who's in school. <laughs> So the adverse effects, uh, I'm sorry, the title of our presentation is What's Eating You and it's about the adverse effects of stress on weight management and we chose this because we found that it was a relevant topic for today's society in the, in, in the college. Um, so we all know that college is stressful and to add to the stress, for many of us, this is our first time being on our own so we don't exactly cook for ourselves, instead we go out and eat fast food or whatever's easy for us. Then we have the added responsibility of being on our own, so we have to do those kinds of things. Also, time management and stress management go hand in hand. Proper time management helps to deal with your proper stress management. It's also stressful attending a new university and not knowing anyone, and for that, um, you have to add on the demand of the nursing program as well. UMFK's nursing program is physically and mentally demanding, as some of you in here may know. Unhealthy stress can lead to unhealthy eating habits and other maladaptive behaviors like cigarette smoking, substance abuse, and use in alcohol. Um, we highlight all of these throughout our presentation. 33.8% of adults are considered obese, 
68% are either considered un overweight or obese. Poor coping with stress transitioning into college can result in excessive weight gain or loss for some people. And we also found that women tend to deal with stress by drinking more than men do. Okay, so for our aggregate assessment, we interviewed 15 nursing students throughout the curriculum. So we had some freshmen, some sophomore, juniors, and seniors. Um, we really wanted to get a basis for how stress affects them differently throughout the curriculum. So um, in a brief summary, for on a scale of 1 to 10, the stress levels ranged from 6 to 9. 10 out of the 15 students reported a weight gain, usually around 5 to 30 pounds. So that's quite a scale. Um, three out of the ten, or sorry, three out of the fifteen actually lost weight and reported that they felt stress made them nauseous and had a diminished appetite, so they didn't really want to eat. And we had two students who really didn't have a change at all. So despite reporting levels of around six, they one felt it was a positive influence, like a positive stress, and the other still thought it was negative, but had pretty good healthy choices anyway, so it didn't affect them. Um, we questioned the students about their binge eating habits, binge drinking, um, their sleep patterns, if it's been affected. Usually stress is more uh, felt more during exams or any type of pressure for projects or papers. Um, we also talked to them about their stress load. And using the information that we gathered, um, we apply it to the six dimensions of health. And it's really helping us to find factors to help that helps contribute to stress aside from what we experience every day. So it's influences. So for biophysical, we looked at like age and gender demographics. So the ages for our interviewees were 18 to 50. And we had five males and 10 females because statistically females do experience stress at higher uh, levels than men do. For psychological, as Holly mentioned, college life can be stressful for freshmen or sophomores or anyone who's new to being on their own. It incorporates uh, new responsibilities, environments, and new friends, plus the stresses of being in school and having to show up on time and not having your mom wake you up for you. <laughs> and if you're a non-traditional student, you've got you know housework, families, um, you're doing your homework, and you have to do group projects. So it doesn't really matter what age you are. It really affects you. For your physical environment, a lot of people don't think the weather can impact you, but being in the northern part of the state, we do have longer winter months and less sunlight typically, so if you're not somebody who does winter outdoor activities, you can feel like you're shut in for a while. Less sunlight can lead to SAD, which is seasonal affective disorder. Lack of sunlight can actually make you start to feel depressed. That can add to your stress and the way that you handle coping. Another issue for the physical environment are the chairs that some of us have to sit in for our three hour long classes. Um, folding metal chairs or cushions that are old, it really does put stress on your body. It makes it hard for you to focus through what we have one day of classes that ranges from eight in the morning until four at night. And you're gonna be sitting in these chairs and it does make it difficult to hold still and pay attention. For sociocultural, it really deals with what we've already mentioned. It's the binge eating, the binge drinking, um, peer pressure or support, thank you, <laughs> or the lack of support and substance use and abuse. If you don't have a good foundation, whether it's friends or family, it makes it just even more hard because you're alone and you have what you feel like is no one to turn to. For behavioral, uh, we looked at time availabilities of the gym and the dining facilities. We did find that there are some conflicting times between class schedules and the times that they're open. So that can make it difficult to maintain a consistent eating or working out program. Uh, we also analyzed the poor food choices despite having healthier foods offered and really comfort foods are a crutch. It's what we all want to go back to. It's easier to do that and it makes you feel better so that's the typical um, response. Night eating syndrome is a problem with late night study sessions where you eat and you're snacking and you're up until all hours and then you fall asleep. It's really bad for your, your body, your metabolism. Everything slows down. For healthy systems, um, we looked at what the programs and resources were available and we really looked at promoting these services because while we found there are excellent sources available, not a lot of students are aware that they exist and so we want to promote those services. Sorry, <laughs> I have the next one. Okay, 
So um, we incorporated our stress goals with the Healthy People 2020, and they really are, have a bunch of object objectives for health and wellness that they would like to achieve by the time 2020. So for the first goal that we tied in with our uh, aggregate is the promotion of health and reduced chronic disease risk through the consumption of healthy diets. So we want you to be making good choices and understanding what a healthy diet is. And it doesn't mean cutting out everything, it just means balance. And that with stress, it's even more important to have a healthy diet so that you don't have the adverse effects. The next goal is about sleep because college students tend to not sleep. They stay up, they're stressing, you know, you're cramming all night for a session for an exam the next day. So you want to increase public knowledge of the, how adequate sleep and the treatment of sleep disorders can improve health and productivity as other things. But what's really important is that adequate sleep is necessary to perform well in school. You really, it's almost better to get the full eight hours of sleep than it is to cram those 20 pages of notes that you've made. So with all of that combined, we came up with three nursing diagnoses, and I'm just going to hit on those real quick. Um, for the people who have gained weight in our interview, we had a nursing diagnosis, excuse me, to help them understand what their problem was. And same with the people who've lost weight. So you're going to look at either more than you're eating more than you're supposed to or less than. And one of the major risk factors is stress overload, where it really gets to the point where everything kind of goes to the adverse side of things. Okay, and the, the next focus was on um, nursing interventions. And nursing interventions are, there, there are three levels that comprise um, the preventions, and that's the primary, secondary, and tertiary. And basically, the primary takes aim or action at um, promoting health uh, and wellness uh, be prior to a health condition starting, So, and we want to prevent um, the occurrence of these issues. And then the secondary would focus on early identification and treatment of the uh, health problems through screening and diagnosis. And then tertiary interventions would um, concentrate on returning a patient to optimal health and the highest level of functioning um, and avoiding any further health decline. So then uh, with our um, assessment, um, we came up with some primary level interventions which of course, we wanted to promote all the um, available resources that we have uh, free to us here on the campus even, um, which included our health clinic. And a lot of folks don't know that there is a mental health component there as well for counseling services that are available. And um, many, many stress reduction type services through our support, uh, student support services, um, some help on learning how to time manage and um, even budgeting, tutoring, all, all kinds of different aspects there. And also um, our wellness center, or excuse me, the, the, our sports center here on campus is uh, actually free to all students. There's sometimes we get the uh, opinion through just what we've overheard and, and through our um, interviews that they thought that the uh, sports center was available only to uh, the athletes or on-campus students. But it is actually a free service um, available for everyone. And there's quite a few things over there, racquetball courts. We have the um, access to the Heritage Trail uh, for walking and biking. And of course, a full workout, um, well, a weight room and a cardiovascular room. Um, and also, um, we wanted to mention that our faculty, we can't forget of what a valuable resource they are to all of us here. Uh, a lot of times they, I mean, they want us to succeed and they're available to help us and talk to us and maybe help circumvent issues before they get out of hand, especially if we are um, going to them earlier in the process rather than later. So, and then we also wanted to promote um, adoption of certain um, practices that may help um, with stress management, weight management, making sure you get enough exercise. Uh, as we found out early this morning, a lot of us have smartphones. Uh, there are apps on there that are free. Um, you know, my fitness tracker, everything from hydration to uh, all the calories you maybe should be eating based on your weight and what your goals are. Um, and also, again, uh, incorporating any exercise that you're getting. It, so it's kind of neat and it, it kind of turns your focus um, to all these elements when you're having to put them in all the time, it kind of becomes a habit and it's, it was a good thing. And also my, uh, myplate.gov was a good resource also for some free tracking and a lot of advice and calorie counting and that sort of thing. 
Um, then, of course, peer accountability is another good thing where we can get together and um, walk together and work out together, um, maybe decide we're not going to go for pizza even though we really want to or, you know, stick, stick together on things. And then, of course, um, all of the, uh, some of the primary level preventions do overlap the others as well, depending on um, some modifications to each one of those that I mentioned. Um, we want to um, obviously modify our time management skills and seek some counseling service um, if we are actually into the, we are express, um, expressing health issues and weight management, either you're losing or gaining, or you know for sure that stress is taking its toll on you. Um, so, of course, discontinuing or decreasing uh, the use of um, some substances that might not be the best for us with smoking or um, drinking as mechanisms, um, we need to get rid of those. And also, then on the tertiary level, we would look at maybe furthering counseling, um, t taking it to a different level, even if you have been looking to your family or to faculty or whatever, you might need to take it to more of a professional level. And some of the pharmacological interventions that may be associated with um, weight management or anxiety, uh, those types of things. And alternative and complementary therapies are great for stress reduction. We have, you know, Reiki and massage and healing touch and a variety of things too that sometimes you don't really think about. but. Um, we could check into and of course support system enhancement we were kind of thinking that you do need to find um, folks that understand what you're going through and and work together and also make sure that um, that you're not afraid to maybe admit sometimes even to your family if they're asking how you're doing and you want them to think oh everything's great and I'm doing fine but really you know sometimes it is okay to be real make sure that they understand what types of pressure we're going through and the academic uh, complications and trying times that we go through. So, and then in uh, conclusion of our presentation, um, basically we were talking about um, the vital goal for healthy weight management is stress management and that promoting available resources and taking individual responsibility for ourselves, um, effectively controlling known stressors and ultimately impacting it, the overall wellness of students um, would be a major goal of um, our, uh, our aggregate project that we made. And through caring for others and leading by example, nurses and all of us um, can help lead the nation to achieve the goals of Healthy, 20, Healthy People 2020 and beyond. Does anybody have any questions? have about 40 seconds for, for <laughs> questions. <laughs> yes, we live in a stressful world and we need to cope with it. So <laughs> questions from the audience. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The hours for, the hours for, for what? For the gym. I believe on Monday through Friday it's open from 8 to 10 p.m. and then on Saturday and Sunday I think it's 12 to 6 but I could be wrong on the Saturday and Sunday part. And right on the website. Yeah and then on the website the, that's I think an underutilized page here too is uh, our resources on our website when you click on student, um, uh, student affairs and you go down it will open up all kinds of we, we've, we learned a lot <laughs> through our <laughs> research project that we didn't know it was there and it has a lot of different things and helps you with hours and who to contact yeah. and that sort of thing. And then free to the nursing students as well was the uh, wellness center that is um, su supported through um, Northern Maine Medical Center here. That is free for the use of uh, nursing students for sure. Well, thank you kindly for a most professional and informative talk.
I'd like to present Vesa Villarreal, and she'll be talking about a day in the life of JJ. Uh, hello, I'm, my name is Vesa, and I am an education major here. This is my first year. And I did a project called A Day in the Life of JJ, and what that means is I literally went through a day with JJ, which he is my uncle, and all I did was I went to his work with him. This is Jay. And I just wanted to see how he communicates and if there's any way I could improve it at all. So this is Jay, he's 35, and he has cerebral palsy. And when I say that, it's a disease that can be, that can affect the muscles and can cause, and he's mentally challenged. So it's, <clears throat> it's either mild or severe, and you have moderate and everything in between. And when I say mild, it means just he can walk without a walker, he doesn't need a wheelchair or any type of assistance. He can do daily activities, sometimes small things like maybe climbing the stairs or little things like that is the only thing that can cause an issue. So, and also Jay's speech is affected. He can't actually form words. He knows some stuff. He knows what numbers are, but can only say eight. He knows what colors are, but can only say blue. He knows animals, can say duck, stuff like that and make the noises. Jay has several interests. As you can see, there's clowns, cops, firefighters, uh, tractor trailers, race cars, and that's just some of them. The list goes on and on, and they change every day. So it's kind of confusing if somebody doesn't know exactly what he's saying. He makes up his own signs. Like for a clown, he goes like this. And since the circus is around, that's his thing right now, is the clowns. But the other thing that he does to communicate, other than making his signs, if somebody doesn't exactly know, um, he keeps written notes in his wallet that his mother writes for him. And I made somewhat of a chart. So let's say the message you want to get across is JJ is going to the circus this weekend, which he is. So his mom would write a note. We put it into his wallet. So before he pulls out the note, there's him talking on the left one. And then somebody says, huh? So he pulls out the note. Then they understand, and they can see the conversation in that direction and continue to talk with him. So I saw this and I thought, how can this be more efficient? What can we do to fix this? Because when I went to his work, somebody had told me, they said, it's finally nice to put a face to all the notes. And I thought, why should anyone have to wait to see me or anybody else in Jay's notes? How can I fix this so they can know right away? He used to have a thing called a Dynavox, which is the one up in the corner up there and it's bulky it's bad on battery life and it couldn't say anybody's name right like if you put it in it wouldn't say it it was totally different and it sounded what you would think of as a typical robot voice so I brought an iPad with me that I borrowed and we used it and he, he knows how to use it and he when he watches people use stuff he's more likely to use it and the fact that nobody really has a Dynavox is makes it kind of hard for him to really know and not a lot of people know how to work it. Everybody now knows how to work an iPad, mostly. For the most part, everybody knows. So I looked into apps that we could use, and there's so many out there. So I thought, why, why not take advantage of these apps? They are, there's some that are free, and there's some that aren't. So when I looked into them, I found simple talking boards with just pictures, because he's very visual, and those ones were free. And then I found some that were totally customizable. You could do anything and it was endless, the things you could do. But that one was $200, which is a little bit more than free. So the thing I found that was most like his notes was a thing called Sonic Picks. And all it is is it only costs $2.99, which I thought was better than 200 And basically what it is, it allows you to do a slideshow and have an over voice with it. I tried to get the video on here couldn't do it, it wouldn't work. I don't know why. But basically what you do is, <clears throat> I'm just gonna walk over here, it'll be easier. Okay, so what you do is you take all your photos and you put them in here, and then right there where it says tap here to begin recording, all you do is you push that, and as you're going through your pictures, you just talk, like this, whatever they had. This one was on somebody's vacation. So they just continue to talk, and as when they want to go to the next picture, they just slide it over and keep talking with that one, and so on and so on. So all it does is it basically creates a slideshow, and you can publish it onto YouTube, email, Facebook, anything like that, and you can play.
website to your iTunes and everything. You've created a URL to have your own website for just this one video. So, like with this one, when they were done, you can preview it before, you can edit your pictures, you can pretty much do anything with them. So, we did this with one of his announcements because when I went there, they were going to be, they do like snacks every week or so on. So, we did that one and um, all it was was I took a picture of him at Walmart because they had to plan what they wanted and then we went to Walmart, I took a picture, it was only three pictures and all it was was basically said, this on Friday, this Friday, Jay's going to be making smoothies for a snack. And that's what I did. So, <clears throat> so I thought that this would be probably the best thing for him to use. Let me see. Okay. So, this, writing this speech was probably the most difficult thing I had to do. I've wrote multiple speeches before. This was the hardest one. Not only because it's on education and technology, but because it's on somebody I know personally and I have known my whole life. I've been around him since I was two or three years old. I can understand most of what he says. Sometimes he makes up his own things, but I, and I don't know. But, so, <clears throat> let me see. And Jay spent his life with, he's had cerebral palsy since the day he was born, and there's certain people that have told him, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, you know, you're limited to what you can do, you can only do certain things. And people say that he suffers from a disease. I don't think that anybody's suffering, especially not him. He embraces everything about it, and he makes other people want to be better at what they do. So I thought, he never lets anything stop him. He's graduated from high school. He, ha he has an honorary firefighter. He's a clown, a shriner, everything else. He has all the costumes and everything to go with it. So I thought, why should something as small as talking set him back at all? And I thought that through this way, it would be the most, thing, the most beneficial thing to do for him. <clears throat> and he is what fuels my passion for education because I'm, I want to go into special education. And at this time, I'd like to introduce you all to Jay because he's here with us today. So. <clears throat> don't really have much more to say. So if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, have you done any research to find out if there is any, um, I want to say science, resources available for someone else or other people such as Jason who have communication disabilities to get iPads or anything like that to facilitate that communication? But, you know, I'm assuming that the DynaWalk is your own coverage system for making the toys. Yeah. They covered them, and they had it at his school that he goes to. They the Dynavox or the... Uh, the Dynavox okay, yeah. is what he started out with, and so that was funded, mm -hmm. and he worked with somebody at the school to do it. But the fact that nobody else at home had one, it was a little bit harder for, for us to try and follow along. So there is funding out there, and we're looking into it. We don't know exactly if we could get any funding towards that, towards, it, towards an iPad, because he had the Dynavox. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have about six minutes. Yes, ma'am. Um, he can do, he knows some sign language. It's limited to what it is. Like, he knows more when he says thank you. It's this. It's stuff that he's just picked up along the way. He does make up his own sign language. Like, a harvester, he goes like this. Or money, and just stuff like that. He kind of just does his own along the way. Yeah. Thank you kindly, Vessa. So.
Okay, our next presenters are Katie McMillan and David Johnson, and they'll be talking about the main theme of our symposium, technology and learning. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, initially, um, last year, a symposium participant, Tony Gagnon, uh, performed a piece on guitar and uh, had written something for his symposium piece. So we were actually initially going to do an interpretive dance on education technology, but we were advised against it, so uh, we decided not to. And no one wants to see me do the robot anyway, so. Um, so as, as pre-service teachers, uh, we are often challenged and encouraged to use uh, new technologies uh, in the classroom. And um, Louis had touched on some of the ones that we're going to discuss, uh, but um, we're going to just kind of mention three of them and how we have found them important uh, in our um, practice teaching, as we have been doing. Okay, so we're kind of echoing a bit of what Louis said in the first presentation this morning um, about how important social media has become in our society, and especially in our classrooms. I mean, most students these days have cell phones and they're just dying to use them. So one of the new technologies we found was an app called Study Blue. So it's for your phone, and um, it's just a way to incorporate um, the students using their cell phones, but also focusing on their schoolwork. So as you can see, there's a photo there, and it helps them organize their work, um, create notes, and then also share their work with their students and their teachers. So um, it's a, it gives them an excuse to use their phone, uh, but they're still focusing on uh, schoolwork. So two of the um, software applications that we've um, also decided to discuss that we feel are important are Google SketchUp and Google Earth. Um, they are 3D modeling programs uh, that really can be used for a broad range of applications. Uh, they include um, things to be used for the private sector, for engineering, mechanical, civil, uh, for film, uh, the performance arts, uh, for redesigning the sets to get a kind of a 3, 3D dimensional uh, kind of look. Uh, they're also really important and successfully used in uh, grade schools in the classroom. Uh, for mathematics, uh, to see three-dimensional objects uh, when you're trying to uh, teach geometry can be a really important tool. Also, geography, you can essentially take the students to um, China to go down to the streetscape and look at some of the buildings, look at population density. Um, and history is also very important. You can go to different regions and see um, how population has increased and really just travel all around the world. So it's been a very important uh, tool. The next slide will be a video of a history teacher who is um, teaching in Hartford, Vermont. And he finds it a very important tool in, in teaching his students and engaging them. It started out a year ago, a year ago January. Um, and the first month was a typical history class. I gave them write-ups about the town of Hartford. They had to create a timeline for our town. And a lot of them knew that we were going to be using technology, but the first couple of weeks we didn't touch computers. It was all reading and trying to get some background. And then I introduced them to SketchUp, and that's when they started buying into the class. They went through the tutorials of um, SketchUp and the self-paced one, as well as some YouTube tutorials. And then they started taking pictures of the building and creating the buildings, and that's when they got hooked. The SketchUp itself, it's an addictive piece of software. It's something that once you start using it, you want to keep using it. And we've been driving around Vermont, and as we're driving around, they're watching SketchUp tutorials on uh, my band DVD player, and which is pretty pretty nerdy, but uh, it, it's funny. They, they they drive by buildings and they say, "Oh, that'd be cool to sketch it up." And it's 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 pretty interesting to see the transition that they made from a history class to uh, to a digital architecture class with the history as kind of a, a background. But the great thing is is that everybody else gets to see the history because of the passion that they've gotten for designing the buildings. 
doing something that people around the world can see every day. It's intriguing. That's kind of what brought me into the class in the beginning. Um, using the technology and just doing new stuff instead of just working out of a textbook all day and writing papers. It's you're doing stuff that other people can see all the time. The only I'm most proud of would probably be uh, the Wave Reviews building, which is uh, in downtown Wave River. It's just, it's clean, so I'm pretty proud of that one. I'm modeling a railroad grid in downtown Wave River Junction right now. It's really cool because I can go on any computer in the world and see a building I created on Google Earth. Talking with teachers around the state, uh, this is something that I've been encouraging, especially foreign language teachers who are always trying to find a way of getting the culture into their classroom. I told them, go on Google Earth. A lot of you, you go to Rome and see the Colosseum, and you can see, go to uh, France and see the Eiffel Tower, and you can see these, these buildings. and. You know, you get a better feel when you actually get to see the 3D model versus always looking at a map or a picture of it. So I think I think it's something that more and more teachers are going to start using it in their in their daily lessons. So I, I teach a freshman cultural geography class, and I use it for everything. I mean, to show Hong Kong and the number of buildings and the size of the buildings in such a small area. You know, if I didn't have Google Earth. You know, you could, you could show a picture or a map and it's just not the same. We're actually physically getting down at the street level and walking around. And it's, it's really a nice little added piece to my, my lesson plans. Some teachers may, may say, you know, that the book history is, is more important, but I feel like the end result is these guys are teaching versus learning. And that's when you really become a student is when you, when you make that transition to teaching. So I, I think I think learning to sketch up is, is really important for a history class like this. Hey, I teach integrated technology. So as you just saw from the video, students are most engaged when they're playing, you know, games, when they're looking at animation and 3D objects that they're able to move around with a click of a button. Um, students play recreationally video games often, both male and female. So some of these applications uh, have been a success. Um, we, we've heard it time and time again. Um, yeah, and just, I just want to add that as far as Google Earth goes, I think it gives the students an opportunity um, that they may not get otherwise to go to the Eiffel Tower, to go to Hong Kong. I mean, in our lifetime, uh, a lot of us don't get those opportunities. So I just think that these resources that are um, available to us, I, I don't know why we wouldn't use them. So just to wrap things up, um, this year we have been able to experiment with lots of technology that is con conducive to higher learning for our future students. Um, when David and I put this presentation together, it was hard. We knew we only had 10 minutes. It was hard to pick um, the, the technology that we wanted to use. So I just put some other examples like student blogs, live binders, and lesson casts. If there's any future teachers out there, these are great resources that are available and they're very engaging for the students. So we just wanted to end with a quote by David Warlick. Um, we need technology in every classroom and in every student and teacher's hand because it is the pen and paper of our time. And it is the lens through which we experience much of our world. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Absolutely. Um, I think one of the most important things is that technology is great, but in, as far as the classroom, there's still a teacher and you still have to be aware of everything else that's going on. I mean, you still have to monitor your students to make sure that what they're doing is that they're on task, they're doing what they're asked. Because with technology, it's very easy to get sidetracked. So you just have to be aware of those things. And, and though these, uh, the technologies that we discussed are free, 
Um, they're easily downloadable. You can just search them on Google. Um, I mean, if you're from a, a lower socioeconomical uh, area, it, it, you know, and you, and you don't have access to a computer, it will be more uh, difficult uh, to uh, partake in some of the, uh, the pedagogy. Other questions? If there's no further questions, please thank Kate and Dave. Oh, did I miss something? Oh, sorry. That's a really good question, and I think that is the main reason behind this presentation is that cell phones are inevitable. We all know Doris always says, if you're looking down, I know you're texting. Like, so why not just let them use their phones? If you have a phone and you have an app like this where you're, you're using a piece of technology, but you're still focusing on what's important, you're organizing your work, and you can still share with your friends or whatever. So I personally think that we need to move in this direction. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> cell phones, I mean, there's such a negative stigma uh, associated with them and education. I think it's going to take some time before they're integrated fully into uh, the curriculum. starts off by them drawing the building, but then maybe it's going to engage them into researching more about this building, like how old is it, where is it, um, those type of things. I think, sorry. Yeah, well, I mean... I mean, that's, that's just a short clip. I mean, we don't know, you know, what happened for the rest of the class. Um, you know, by the students reconstructing buildings that are, you know, in their town, they're able to research them as they, you know, they're probably looking at blueprints. They're probably looking at, you know, old town plans. And, uh, you know, I'm sure it's a pretty uh, comprehensible, pretty, um, you know, involved lesson. Again, that's just a sample. That's just it's a sample just an video. Example. And I'm sure people could get together at lunch today and, and further discuss this, but 
No, no uh, uh, throwing food, please. Yeah. Thank you. Our next presenter is Katie Levesque, and she'll be reading some poetry for us. Just one poem. Um, what I'm going to, to discuss is very personal to me in the relation to my education. I'm here to read a poem about being a mother while earning my degree. For those of you who have children, you may relate. Foremost, before reading my poem, I would like to discuss a few things. Since it, it, since it was the topic at hand today, I would like to start off by discussing the role of technology in our lives. I am an English major, so I have difficulty speaking highly of it. It is in discord with my being that libraries and small bookstores are becoming passe. I hate that schools are filled with smartphones and laptops and iPads and the like. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am proud to have one shoulder that is lower than the other because of years of improperly carrying my 40-pound backpack around, heavy and loaded with books, notebooks, and pencils. I fear that largely we are blinded by our technology. It is required, though, that I must humbly eat my opinion at times and thoroughly admit that as a mother, technology has made finishing my degree so much easier. Anyone else in here with children, I know, will verify the advantages to the online classroom in relation to time management. In a larger perspective, we are able to share our minds with people thousands of miles away. As a writer, the notion of sharing minds is an important one. The advantages technology has given us are beyond my biased and cynical opinion. I may continue to remain stubborn and live without the newest technological gadgets, but please feel free to correct me when I rant on about the tragedies of our mindless, fast-paced societal self-destruction, when major diseases are being cured at the hands of those who benefit from these technological advancements. It is important, though, to let go of technology in moments when hanging on is not beneficial to anyone. To discuss my education, which hardly relates to technology save for my laptop, yes, after all of that, I do own a laptop, I am proud to say that I will be marching this spring. I am not a goal-oriented woman in the sense of what our society deems as essential goals. Hence, graduating from college is a big deal for me. Professors and educators in the audience may prefer not to hear me speak of this as if it is of no problem to me. I will not say this way I am is never problematic. This often made college difficult, and it has taken me seven years to graduate with a four-year degree but I would never condense those seven years for anything. People ask me, what are you going to do after you graduate? Teach? I laugh and say no. I do not strive to be anything in the world of careers. The word career has this tone to it, this apartness that requires something else of me, something I know I do not have nor desire to acquire. What I do care about is that I have the time to work on what is important to me, creating a better me based on what I know and continue to learn about myself. This is my goal and one that is never ending. To me, this is my education and my job as a successful participant in our society. 
Part of this is being a person who is loving to her family and community and who participates in the life around her. But the part of me that emanates from my soul is to be successful in the calling which has been bestowed upon me. Successful in the sense that it becomes an integrated part of who I am and how I share myself with the world. English programs are essential and crucial in this way. My education here as an English major has not only been about reading and writing. In fact, that was only a fraction. It was more of a self-exploration with the use of critical thinking and deep comprehension. This is essential in every aspect of life. To really know what it means to understand and the different dimensions of understanding. I am a writer. If you read biographies of writers and artists, you will come across very few who were able, able to survive solely off of their craft. This is the path I have chosen. This, I am certain, is what I was born to do. As long as I am doing it, I will be successful to myself. As a mother, I have a very important message to send to my children. That is, to find the balance between enjoying life and helping life. To find what you are good at and to utilize it in the world around you. If I do not strive to fulfill myself as a writer, I am not sending that message to my children. So when I am 70 and looking back and seeing moments like these, like the one I am in right now, sharing my words with a group of people, I will know that I have done something important. And to bring my monologue to a close, the poem I will be reading has little to do with technology. And with my minimalist use of technology, I make a point in itself. It does have a place, as I have made sure to mention. But think of how special life is when we have moments without our gadgets. The poem I will be reading to you today is about stealing moments away from my daughter to write and what it means to me when I do. Instead, writing. Sometimes I steal an extra bit of time while you're upstairs dealing with our little imp. I feel guilty while the running of her feet fall upon the floor above me. I'm sorry. I know you're telling her, we need to brush your teeth now. I know she's fighting you. It's time to put our books away, but she's hiding in the closet. I'm working on my studies, I say. I put my own guilt into the satisfaction of writing or rewriting. Only the mother of mothers in my soul of creation, she tells me, your child is sleeping and your quick kisses may not follow her into her dreams. I will walk up the stairs to peer into her crib Wisps of hair will have fallen about her face while her thumb will have fallen limp from her mouth. I will hear her breathing from those sweet lips on her tender face, so sweet, so lovely. I should only be so lucky. Thank you. Any any thoughts or questions? It's not really conducive to questions, I guess, but And I'm glad you mentioned that because the whole time I was writing this and preparing for this and fully understanding that this was going to be a day of technology and, you know, boasting technology. So I guess I was very nervous and very like, you know, 
worried that it wasn't going to be well received and people were going to attack me with like, well, our technology is great, you know, and whatever. So I'm really glad you said that. Thank you. That made me feel a lot better. <laughs> Are you, you seriously asking me this? What? <laughs> <laughs> so, can you repeat? I'm sorry. Is it text, text regardless of the device on, upon which it appears? Like... Meaning, why is text more valuable on a paper book than on a phone? Oh, text. Phone? I thought you were talking about texting, like nope. texting. <laughs> um, well, the thing about having a book, I think, is it's a solid thing that, like, you know, if you have a piece of technology, it can be, like, whisked away into this world of, like, we don't know what. You know, and you have a book that you know is going to be there forever, you know, save for a fire that would burn it away. So, I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry. Like, I agree with what you're saying, and I think you make a valid point, absolutely. But, like, I, I'm a book person, so, and I will always root for the, I the books. I like, and I love books, but I also <laughs> like being able to have a thousand books in my pocket. Right. Like the wisdom of the ages. And, yes, you know, <laughs> it, it is very nice to have something that is weightless. And, and it's up to us whether we get distracted or not again. Right. Of what, we're what it is on, absolutely. Maybe I should stand between them just in case. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're really fighting here. No, I, think, we're not. Yeah. I agree with you as a mom, too, is that technology yeah. can't take away because it is so easy and so quick and so accessible. Right. And then they're left to the exactly. TV and, and yeah. Right. Right. But I also do argue that like having online classes while trying to finish my degree exactly. was very beneficial to me. That way, you know, I wouldn't have to like take time to actually go to class. Which you should go to class. It's it's a great experience to be in class. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> online classrooms are helpful. <laughs> It's more a comment you might want to, and I apologize, you'll probably have to look online for it, but there was a piece in the last two days about a gentleman who dropped off the internet and got rid of his smartphone for a year, and it, it's a very interesting piece to read and look at. I, I have not heard that. I will definitely look into that. Yep. Any other questions? If not, thank you kindly for your presentation. Thank you. And I'd really like to thank our uh, student presenters today. I, I just want to say it was very informative, very professional, and yes, personal, and at times a little emotional. So I thank you kindly for all your contributions and your ability to get up there and, and give talks. And uh, that ends our session, but I'd like to remind you there's lunch coming, and we expect you to see, see you all at the uh, poster presentations this afternoon. Thank you kindly for attending.